Man, I can't believe it, but we are in our last week of our Renovate series. This week, we're talking about the issue of worship. And you know what? We probably commonly think of worship of what we do when we come to church and the worship band starts playing. We stand up and we worship. That Actually, that's one of my favorite things about coming to church here. But worship is something that we're going to learn that embodies everything in our life. And so welcome, and I encourage you to embrace what we have to share about worship being something about how we live our life. When we worship, we give up something of ourselves to bring glory to God. I mean, worship and sacrifice are not new ideas by any stretch of the imagination. We worship many things by giving something up. For instance, we sacrifice time by watching four hours of our favorite football team, and we celebrate their victory or we lament their defeat. Yeah, I mean, we sacrifice money by going to our favorite restaurant or any of the types of things that we just love to do. Sometimes we even worship our kids by giving them everything and anything that they want instead of delaying gratification or even teaching them obedience, which God actually says is better than sacrifice. This week's memory verse is Psalm 100, and it says, Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever ever, and his faithfulness continues to each generation. And worship is a response to revelation. It's a focus of our soul's cry for our maker in heaven, for all that he has done and all that he will do. Worship is how we celebrate, we love, and we bring thanks to God. We worship what we love, and even more, we worship whom we love. And we'll do anything for those that we love. A key portion of Psalm 100 says to serve the Lord with gladness. When we worship God, sometimes we can just get stuck thinking it's just through music, but it isn't just tied to the songs or to singing. Worship is any act that celebrates and thanks and brings adoration to God. We worship when we disciple our children. We worship when we serve our spouse. And we worship when we sacrificially give to the church or to those in need. I mean, being the hands and feet of God gives us a life, and it brings honor and glory to God. And this is true worship. Worship is a decision. It's a decision to make God the priority instead of ourselves, and choosing to make the ordinary extraordinary by pursuing Him over our own desires and our wants. If we look at it that way, a decision, then it can take a little bit of the pressure off of us and our response during a worship service. It doesn't have to be just through the songs that touch our heart. It's actually a decision to be obedient and honoring to our God who loves us so much. So here's our first question this week. Pause the video here and go ahead and discuss that now. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Worship is sacrificial. We've covered that. And we worship what we love and whom we love. We've covered that too. Worship also involves trust. 
It's trusting in who God says He is and trusting in what God says He has done. When we trust God, we can give ourselves as a holy sacrifice. We can change the way we think. We can be less selfish and more focused on what God has called us to be, His hands and feet. If you think about it, worship is solely focused on God because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. We are given this opportunity to die with Christ and be born again with Him and have our sins forgiven. And right then and there, we begin to being renovated by the Holy Spirit to become more like Jesus. And when we let the Holy Spirit in, He transforms us into the Imago Dei, or the image of God. When I relinquished control of my life to God, I had a decision to make. I could try and pilot myself on the ride God wanted to take me on, or I could trust He knew where He was taking me, that He would take care of me, and that I could just let go. I see the same thing in my two young girls. Sure, they want to take the wheel every now and again, but in the end, they know that I love them, and I would never steer them the wrong way. I mean, totally. I really do see the same thing in my boys as well, and it does all come back down to trust. I mean, if we trust that God is good and that He has everything under control, then what do we have to be afraid of? I mean, why is it so hard to peel our hands off the steering wheel and just let Jesus take the wheel? Wait, was that a Carrie Underwood reference? Um, no. Mm, now that I don't trust. Well, moving right along into the second question this week, go ahead and pause the video here and discuss it with your group. Probably wasn't a Carrie Underwood reference. Jesus, take the wheel, take it from my hands, cause I can't do this on my own. The song is not the only means of worship. It is a crucial way that we as a body of believers can be of like mind when we gather on a Sunday morning. When we worship at Canyon View, we are very intentional that all the songs we're singing go vertical. They're singing straight to God. Yeah, we proclaim His goodness, His faithfulness, His conquering of sin and death, His kingdom here and now, and His kingdom yet to come. I mean, we gather and worship in one accord, and we bless the heart of God. We welcome Him to have His way, and we put our hope and trust in Him. And more than anything, we are together with our Father. Think of our earthly fathers. We don't just simply tell them from afar how awesome they are or yell thanks for not killing us when we were teenagers. If you're blessed to have a great relationship with your dad, you want to spend time with him. You want him to know how thankful you are and how much he means to you. We want our dads to know that they mean the world to us. And when we worship, whether through song or through our actions, we're simply doing just that. We're laying everything else aside and we're focusing solely on our God in heaven. Yeah, that's right. And really that does bring us to our third question for this week. And actually this is the last discussion question that we have for you in the Renovate series. I just wanted to take a minute and we really just wanted to say thank you for hanging out with us for the past seven weeks or so. And we hope and pray that God uses our time together to draw you closer to Him and that you would be able to start tearing down the walls that are keeping you from Him and rebuild areas of your lives around a deeper understanding of who God is and what it means to follow Him and how we can be more like Jesus every day. So thank you so much for sacrificing or worshiping with your time through this series and know that we will be praying for you all. Okay, go ahead and pause the video here and enjoy the last bit of your discussion together as a group. Okay, what'd you think of that? Now, here's what I want you guys to do as we conclude Renovate. I want you to think of one area of your life about what would be different if you brought an attitude of worship into that one area. For instance, if it's work, think about Jesus being with you in your work and your work is an expression of worship to Him. Maybe it's in your housework. Think about Jesus being with you there in the home, 
and everything you're doing for your family is an expression of worship. I want you to pick one thing in your life that would make an amazing difference for the kingdom as you worship God through that activity. So God bless you guys. As we conclude this Renovate series, what my heart is really wanting to say to everybody is continue to live out these spiritual principles in your day-to-day -day life and you will continue to just be transformed from the inside out for the glory of God. Let's go grow together. Bless you guys. Josh, how are you? Blessed. Huh. I'm glad you recognize that, but what makes you think you're particularly blessed right now? Oh, I have a new recipe for green chili burritos that's gonna add piquancy to my table. Piquancy? I don't think I've ever heard you use that word. Oh, I'm trying to improve on several fronts with my vocabulary, my recipes, and my blessedness. Well, Josh, you know, the first couple of verses of Psalm 1 says that we are blessed by the things that we avoid. As believers, we're not to live our lives in the same way that unbelievers do, and we're not to be mockers of the Christian way of life. So is there anything in Psalm about burritos? No, not really. But it does talk about trees and bearing fruit in season. Now, the trees here are a metaphor for Jesus' followers who bear fruit for the appropriate seasons of their Christian life. So no piquancy, no burrito, no perfect recipe? No, no, and no. However, the Bible does say that we are to be holy as Jesus was holy. But we get our holiness from our faith in him, not by our actions and also not in any perfect burrito recipe. However, we are told to clean up our act and stop doing the things that non-believers do. Uh, clean up our act? Yeah, you know, start taking your thoughts captive. Stop thinking about unimportant things like burritos. Start memorizing scriptures that are important to you. You know, God says to think about things that are true and honorable and right. So memorizing scripture like Psalm 1? Exactly. I just don't get it. Psalm 1 says that we should stay away from the wicked, the sinners, the mockers. That means I'd have to stay away from a lot of my friends and actually a lot of my family. Well, Josh, maybe rather than avoiding them, this could be the perfect opportunity for you to share the gospel with them and, and help them learn about Jesus. I mean, this is exactly what Jesus did. Yeah, but how am I supposed to do that? Look at the second verse in Psalm 1. It says, this guy's delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So here's a question. How often do you read the Bible? Meditate? I don't do drugs. You're thinking medicating. I said meditating. Oh, good. You had me worried there for a minute. Let's get back to Psalm 1. So if you spend some time each day reading the Bible and thinking about those verses, you can begin to change your life. Okay, but how do I do that? Well, you begin to do the things that the Bible says. What's the second great commandment? Mm, a burrito a day keeps the doctor away? No. It's actually love your neighbor as yourself. How am I supposed to love my neighbors? I don't even know them. Well, sharing the gospel with them is a pretty loving thing to do, but also try serving them unprompted, like shovel their sidewalk or rake their leaves. They may ask you why you're doing it, but you can say, you know what, I'm just trying to be like Jesus. Once you start serving people, it will become a habit. Now, they might begin to like you and invite you for dinner. The Bible says to do that? Read it, Josh. Find out for yourself. Maybe I will. Maybe I will invite my neighbors over. I do have a new recipe to share with them. Hmm. Let me guess. No, bacon-wrapped green chili burritos. They'll nice. love it. So obviously this week we're talking about Scripture and the Bible, God's written word or instructions to us. 
We all know that the Bible is something that we're supposed to read, but we often struggle with understanding what we read or maybe with not reading it enough. Maybe even we disagree with something that we've read in the Bible. One of the things that we saw Josh and Dave talk about was how sometimes the blessings that we read about in the Bible have to do with what we should avoid rather than what we should participate in. And this week's first question addresses exactly that. So why don't we get started and check that out now. Cooking is an awesome gift, and I know some amazing cooks. My grandma makes the best Christmas cookie spread, and I've always wondered how can she make it taste so good? I remember asking her for a recipe to one of my favorites when I was younger, an orange zest cake batter cookie. I remember her writing it out in detail, all the ingredients and the amounts, the stove temperatures, the timings, and the exact directions on how to make them. She even included these little notes on how she discovered this or that adjustment. Now, not having baked myself, I assumed I'd just read this, do that, and then bam, the perfect Christmas cookies would pop out. Well, my first attempt was disappointing to say the least. Going back to one of the little notes that I found at different altitudes, I had to adjust some ingredients. Round two was better, and I started to recognize what was off about my cookies compared to the grandma made ones, and I double checked my portions. The third go was a success, and I finally had grandma approved orange zest cookies. By now, I'd memorized the recipe and I could make them anywhere if 